Louisiana Legends is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. This informative educational series enables us to discover through the accomplishments of our fellow Louisianians the unique character of the state so proudly served by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana for more than 65 years. Even during his boyhood days growing up in Beaumont, Texas, Pat Taylor was surrounded by the oil business. His fascination with stories of wildcatters and gushers soon turned into a serious goal, to become an independent oil man. After winning an academic scholarship, he attended Houston's finest prep school, Kincaid Academy, graduating with honors. On his own since the age of 16, he decided to attend Louisiana State University since it was tuition free at that time. Traveling to Baton Rouge, he arrived with only $50 in his pocket. Though he couldn't pay for all of his books and living expenses, he was allowed to register and received a deferred payment plan from the university. This assistance would play a substantial role in his later life. He graduated in three and a half years with a degree in petroleum engineering. He then enlisted in the Marine Corps, but was discharged early due to health reasons. Still, his love for the Corps has remained strong. When I was the commanding general of uh, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, uh, Pat Taylor approached me uh, on a social note, in a social setting, and we uh, discussed what could be done to honor Camp Lejeune in such a way to pay tribute to the, to the man in which the uh, camp was named after, John A. Lejeune, from basically around the New Rose, Louisiana area. He became the Commandant of the Marine Corps, He's a, literally a legend in the Marine Corps, one of our most famous commandants. Pat Taylor, in his own right, decided to pay for and arrange for all of the uh, uh, logistics uh, for a statue of John A. Lejeune. After working for independent oil man John Meekham, Pat started Taylor Energy Company in 1979. His company is the only individually and solely owned independent oil operator drilling and producing exclusively in the federal waters offshore Louisiana in the Gulf of Mexico. It goes without saying that he was tremendously successful in his chosen field. But Pat Taylor had another goal, and that was to see to it that every American child has the opportunity to go to college. He conceived, developed, and spearheaded legislation called the Taylor Plan, which passed in July of 1989. Today, this program is called the TOPS program and has nearly 38,000 students enrolled. And now, uh, with the Taylor Plan that uh, was called the Taylor Plan, uh, and now that, that, that is evolved into the TOPS program, uh, thousands of young men and women attend college uh, because of what he started. And uh, that's a, that speaks volume to the type of individual that he is. Since his plan was instituted, Pat Taylor has traveled more than 700,000 miles and has spoken to more than 1,000 audiences. More importantly, he has received inquiries from 20 other states about the Taylor Plan. Today, 18 other states have similar tuition assistance programs, and more are in the works. Mr. Taylor feels that by the end of the decade, this plan could be a nationwide program. The list of Pat Taylor's awards, honors, and accomplishments is endless. He was called a national hero by President Bush Sr. in 1998. He has received awards and commendations from the Pope, the Secretary of Defense, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, and a long list of business and educational leaders. Perhaps the most enduring and meaningful award is the knowledge that because of his efforts, tens of millions of children will receive a higher education, a priceless gift from a selfless individual, Pat Taylor. 
Join us now for an interview with a true Louisiana legend. I'm at Lee Square in New Orleans, and I'm with an oil tycoon, a Louisiana <laughs> oil tycoon. He's the real thing, folks. But he's an oil tycoon who has given back to his state infinitely more than this state could give him. I'm with my good friend Pat Taylor, and Pat, it's a pleasure to be with you, sir. Guess it's wonderful to see you again. Pat, you were born in Beaumont, Texas. Yes, sir. But the Lord sent you to a good school, Louisiana State University. How'd you happen to come to LSU? Well, I was, I was as you say, I was, I, I was born in Beaumont, and and I had a I had a good mother that that to push me as far as going to school, that sort of thing. But I was born in the shadow of Spindletop. But as a kid, I didn't, I didn't run and play that much. I didn't have that opportunity, so so I used my time reading and and I concentrated on my schoolwork. But but in reading about Texas, of course, uh, latter day Texas, it's all the old old great oil men, and I wanted to be somebody. I I, I just I wanted to be something different. I didn't want to be just a scared little kid for the rest rest of my life. So I was very fortunate. I, my stepfather moved me to to, to a Houston. Um, actually, pulled me out of the eighth grade, but I ended up going to public junior high in Houston, and my grades were good enough that I won a classic scholarship to a very fine prep school, Kincaid. But then, my junior year, I left home, uh, so I had a rather tough time of it. But 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 I completed at at Kincaid. Uh, I did well, but I needed a petroleum engineering school. And I, I talked to a bunch of oil men in downtown Houston. And then I heard about LSU, and I heard that LSU was cheap. And so I called LSU that spring of my, of my senior year in high school. And they explained to me that they didn't charge tuition. And I said, well, you know, my name's Pat Taylor, and I'll be I'm there. Uh, and of course, you've heard this story a number of times. I got to LSU, and and walked into the old armory field house and had this big long table and I walked over to where the where the T sign was, a signature sign. Lady sitting there and I walked up there and I said, Ma'am, I said, My name's Pat Taylor and I want to go to school. And so she thumbed through a little card file there, no computers of course, and said, Well we don't have a card with your name on it. Did you apply? And I said, Well no ma'am, I didn't apply, but I called y'all last last spring and told you I was gonna be here. She threw up her hand and said, well, where did you graduate from high school? I said, the Kincaid School in Houston. And a fellow about three or four chairs down heard me. And all that, that hullabaloo, just a very close run thing. And he got up and came around and he said, you graduated from Kincaid? And I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, do you have your transcript? And I said, oh, yes, sir, I just happened to have it. And he looked at my high school transcript, and, and he told me the LSU had never had a Kincaid graduate and that I was going to school. Goodness gracious. Now, my problem was I only had $55 in my pocket. I was two days late for three-day registration. I didn't have a faculty advisor, so I signed up for everything in the catalog that I could. And I got to the bursar's office, the bursar's desk, and I had a bill for $205. That was a $35 student fee. I told the Senate committee one time that, that that included football tickets, and they laughed at me, but, <laughs> and $170 room and board. Uh, and I only had $55, I had to buy books. And so I told that bursar lady, I said, uh, I don't have $205. And so she says, well, you go down in that door down yonder. And I walked in that door down yonder, and there was another lady sitting behind the desk, and she said to me, I see your papers, and and I showed her my papers, and she filled out a little slip of paper, and she said, sign here. And I said, well, yes, ma'am, what is this? She said, it's a deferred payment note. So in essence, in essence, LSU took me in. Now, and I avoided paying out-of-state tuition, and, and the statute of limitations has gone on that, and LSU has not really complained <laughs> about that. But I was immensely better qualified than my peers in a freshman class. I'd had four years of English composition. I did math and science. I want to ask you a question. I want to interrupt you. Mm -hmm. 
did you always have a romance, an allure for the oil fields? You see, to people like me, you know, it's some damn pipe sticking out of the ground, and I would like to own one, but to well, you it was a kind of a almost it, mystic It, it thing. goes back to my childhood. It goes back to my childhood. I, I, I can remember the, the 50th celebration of the Spindletop Field in Beaumont, Texas, and they set up a modern modern drilling rig and they set up an old wooden wooden rotary rig like they had had in 1901, that sort of thing. Uh, and then my reading of it, uh, I, I've considered since, since at least my early teens that, that the oil business is, is sort of the last frontier. It's, it's, uh, even it's challenging today. and risking. Oh yes, <laughs> it is still very, very risky. But but that that simply became my dream. I I, I didn't I didn't want to be in I didn't want to be a policeman or a fireman, which which would have been more in keeping with where I came from. Or I didn't want to be in in mercantile or anything like that. I I I, I wanted to be what 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 I thought. I wanted to be what what my heroes were. Goodness sakes. I wanted to be one of those old time wildcatters. Now how did you meet the man who at that time was absolutely Mr. Oil in the world, John Meekum Sr.? Well actually he came along later in life. I had I had uh, I had several uh mentors, shall we say. Uh, I had planned to leave home. Not as soon as I did, but but uh, but there was a great guy named Warren K. Lane who was who who was uh, who had inherited wealth, but uh, but he was an oil man and he gave me my first roughnecking job. And that senior year in high school, when things really started to go bad for me, he you know he sort of took a hand and and bore down on me and made made sure that I didn't go completely wild. Then after that, after that, uh, after I. I finished LSU, and I finished in three and a half years. I was I was hungry. I wanted to go to work, uh, and I came to New Orleans uh, to interview for the only possible job for a petroleum engineer in early 1959, and that was with John W. Meekham Sr.'s organization. Now, but that's one of those rare coincidences that that has to occur for any anybody to achieve great success. There, has, there has to be all these things. This good fortune has to come to you. Well, Mr. Meekum, Mr. Meekum was a trustee of the Kincaid School. So when his organization here interviewed me, well, they could not hire a professional without clearing it with Mr. Meekum, which they did that afternoon. And they sent my transcripts to Mr. Meekum, and Mr. Meekum saw that I graduated from Kincaid, so Mr. Meekum said, hire the kid. So I ended up going to work as a very junior engineer for him. Did uh, you all become friends? Well, we, we became more than friends. Um, I actually worked for him as a petroleum engineer, a field engineer, uh, and later a little bit higher position uh, for about seven and a half years. We had some disagreements, uh, both on the rigs and and off the rigs. When took now, pretty good guts to argue with John W. Beacom at that time. Well, but engineers are supposed to be professionals, and they're supposed to tell the truth. And if yeah. it takes guts to do that, yes, Mr. Meekum could be a fearsome individual. But when I went to work for Mr. Meekum, of course, that was during my rodeoing days, and he had, he he objected. He objected to my riding the bulls. So after about a year and a half, he he called me in and he said, "You have, you know, I have money invested in you. I'm I'm teaching you your business. You're working hard and you're good, but you're you have a choice. You can either work for me or you can ride the bulls. But you're not going to do both. So within the, within the next few months, I I gave up riding the bulls. But about a year later, I found out that people were jumping out of airplanes." For fun, and so I took up I took up skydiving on on a few days off I had, 
It was reported to me that when Mr. Meekham heard about that, by the way, Gus, he says, well, at least if he gets in trouble, I won't have to work a cripple. <laughs> you know, I'm, the reason I'm laughing, John McKithen told me, he said, son, you ain't met nobody like Pat Taylor when we were coming up here to see you. And it turned out to be the truth. So, oh, Pat, very how did you, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to say this very crudely and, and, mm -hmm. and beg your forgiveness. How did you, you accrue the wealth that that has come to you. Well, that, I was asked that question, and, and I've been asked that question any number of times, and and it was not through any great single strike or great or great turnaround. And and I try to explain this to kids wherever I go around the nation. Uh, you don't you don't count on luck. Now, good fortune, yes, but what you have to do, you have to prepare yourself for a successful future. You have to put yourself in a position where things can work for you. Uh, Mr. Meekham ended up firing me because, because he found out I was still jumping out of airplanes. Um, but, that, but that, in essence, put me into consulting. Well, I got a much better job, but, but, but I was working for a big company. I didn't fit with a big company, so at a very early age I went into consulting, and then that allowed me to start accruing a few little wells on my own, a few Pat little productions on my own. Pat wasn't meant to work for anybody. Meekum or anybody else. You just weren't. There's some well, people who are not. You happen to be one of them. And we're close enough where I can say that. that well, I, I, that, that is probably true. Uh, uh, if you look back, if I look back over the years that I was actually on salary, our revenues now are equal to that in just a day or so. Uh, that is true, but also emphasize to young people that you don't just go out on your own immediately, you have to learn your you have to learn your profession, and some people are comfortable with staying employed. Don't you see? Most of my officers have been with me for 17 or 18 years, and I don't want them going out on their own. I want them to stay and stay prosper with, with me. I'm on my hundred and in first well now in federal waters, and. And those 101 wells are the, are the only wells ever drilled in federal waters by an individual. I don't, I have learned that I don't have, it's better for me not to have stockholders or partners or investors. Win, lose, or draw, Taylor Oil. Sir? Win, lose, or draw, Taylor Oil. That's what, the Taylor Energy Company is. Yeah, Energy Company. Pat, and its reputation. I think that the most significant thing that happened to you, there were two. First, you married one of the loveliest ladies. It's been my pleasure to know Phyllis. She's beautiful. She's cultured. If she lacks anything, Gus Weil hasn't seen it. That was number one. And let me add something to that. Phyllis gets no credit for our marriage. She doesn't? No, sir. <laughs> our courtship was one of the most difficult times of my life because, <laughs> because she was so marvelous and, and whereas I had known her not, a lot of women before then, because I was, what, 26, 27 oh, well, years old, I, I didn't intend to ever be married or have children or anything like that, and I met her and things changed overall, and I, but I was, I was, I was not, uh, I was not her family's pick, I was just a, a penniless engineer, a Baptist from East Texas, and, and I courted her just as hard as I could, and I was finally successful, and that, we were married, what, over 36 years ago, but but absolutely, she's uh, she is a prize. Uh, now that affected your life. Yes. The second big thing in Pat Taylor's life affected every citizen of the state of Louisiana forever, in my opinion. In 1988, and mm -hmm. I was working for you. Mm -hmm. I remember it well. You came up with some harebrained screwball <laughs> plan. I saw you trying to sell it, and people would put their hands mm -hmm. in the front of it, where every kid who deserved it could get a college education. Yes. Would you talk a little bit about that? Well, my college education, which, which was extended to me by the people of Louisiana based upon my merit, and that's crucial to understand. That college education, which, which, which I desperately wanted, nobody in my family had ever gotten a college degree. That was my ticket to success. Uh, and that, 
led to rec my accumulation of wealth, led, led to my recognition around the country, sort of a rags, you know, ratio algebra. Yes. You remember Which that. Which you won the award of a ratio that algebra. in 86. Well, that led me going around the country talking to high school kids gave all across you a the country. It yeah. gave me a platform. But I missed the point. My argument was that with all the federal programs and all that stuff, my argument to all those high school audiences was, if I could do it then, you can certainly do it now, and I was wrong. So it was only in, in March of 88 when I was asked to talk to those, those failing kids, 183 kids at Livingston Middle School, as a role model. And this role model business is, is ridiculous unless, unless you can, can show those kids how they can get from where they are to where you are. Yeah. So before I went out there that morning, I had to go back on my own history. Well, what got me where I was, a college education? You hadn't always owned that big plane parked out there. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, so I did. I went out there that day, and, and, and I was going to try something. I was, I was gonna, I was gonna experiment. Now these kids were all going to drop out of school. We've they got all to kind of hurry this along. Yeah, okay, they really all failed. But about. anyway, what I, they were gonna drop out of school until I asked how many of you would like to go to college. And when they, everyone raised their hand. Oh my God. Well, then what I had to understand was there's a whole generation of American kids growing up thinking that college was for other folks. And so I took them on board. And it was their enthusiasm, their change of, of attitude towards education that led me to doing the research in Louisiana to find out who could and could not afford college, and by the way, what percentage of freshmen were succeeding in college. Again, the admission standards are just as important as the funding, and that led to our first two-page Taylor plan, which is has only been expanded. It's not been changed over all these years. How many and states is the Taylor plan in now? Nineteen. That's, Nineteen, that's Gus. That's almost unbelievable. Well, it's, it's, I've, I've had direct involvement in 13 or 14 of those states. Uh, I've lobbied hard for them. We're still working on a number of other states. I'm going to ask you a tricky successful. question. Mm -hmm. Will it ever go national? Yes, I expect it, uh, and, and I think I know how I'm going to do it. And I expect that within the next year or two, it will be national. That's, that's, that's breathtaking. I have a plan. You have changed the, the face of the state. You did another thing that Gus Wilde loves. Our mutual dear friend, John McKithen, who Big passed John. on. Big John, bless his heart. Built that Superdome. Did yes, you and sir. I agree? Saved the great city of New Orleans. He was our last great governor. And people want to honor him. A handful of people. And uh, talked about naming the Superdome after him. Well, that's not going to fly. That. No. So they named the whole sports complex, the dome and the stadium next to it, the we John. We worked it out. Yeah. Yes, sir. And I kept waiting to see, would anybody come forward? Would any human being acknowledge it? Pat Taylor came forward. And there's going to be the most magnificent statue of John Julian McKithen because of Pat Taylor. My statue. Only Pat Taylor. I want to tell you, when I read that, I said to myself, my goodness, was John McKithen right about Pat Taylor? <laughs> well, he, he and especially when Taylor Plan came up in 89. Now, now, he and I served on the LSU board, and that's when we really got to know each other. You know what he told me one time? This is funny. He said, want to know what Taylor's problem is? I said, yes, I would like. I don't, <laughs> they're not obvious. He said, he's too damn smart. <laughs> oh, I said, well. Governor, you... He said he's too Some damn people smart. contradict that. That was what he, that's how he felt about you. Pat, if this state, four and a half billion people, had had just a, a handful of people like you, but big money 
in this state has not always come back in any form. Well, that is true. To that the is people true. of Louisiana. That is true. I know you've had to keep your mouth shut, but you, you've seen it, and, and we could both make a list. Wait a minute, Gus, when have I ever kept my mouth shut? I ain't talking about you. <laughs> talking about me, Wesley. Let me, let me, let, <laughs> let, let me address that. I, we I, only got a minute. Okay, I've been said, I've been asked, I've been told in 1,000, 1,200 appearances in 35 states that that this country needs more Pat Taylors. Yep. I tell them, look over my shoulder. They're coming, all those kids that now have the opportunity, they are the ones that are gonna build this country. They are going to make, make a success of this country and having earned their fortunes, then they will share those fortunes because they will understand that there are generations following them. Sir, on behalf of my fellow citizens and those kids who have a college diploma because of one Pat Taylor, who never forgot his own roots and origin, I just want to tell you, I'm honored to know you and to be your friend. And on behalf of our departed friend, God bless Pat Taylor. Thank you, God. Thank you, You've sir. You've been a great friend. Louisiana Legends is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. This informative educational series enables us to discover, through the accomplishments of our fellow Louisianians, the unique character of the state so proudly served by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana for more than 65 years. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or send 1995 to Louisiana Legends care of LPB, 7733 Perkins Road, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70810. Please allow four to six weeks for delivery. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org.